Is your morning habit slowly poisoning you? Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today's video is sponsored by Built Bar and we'll be chatting about the six scariest side effects of coffee. But first, let me tell you about my sponsor, Built Bar. So it is springtime around here. So we did a major clear out of the pantry this weekend, basically to make room for more Built Bars. <laughs> but if you have not tried my favorite bar yet, you're welcome. I don't know, I find most protein bars on the market are like super chalky and gritty, but Built Bars have a texture, kind of like a nugget or like a thick marshmallow, and it's coated in actual chocolate. Hello. What are we doing today, folks? Mm -hmm. Decisions, decisions. Let's go for like the classic coconut almond. This is one of my favorites. And I didn't know that I liked coconut that much until I had this bar, so. Mmm, combo. Mm. This one's got 18 grams of protein and it's a lower sugar bar. So if you wanna build it into like a hunger crushing combo, I love to pair it with oatmeal or toast or fruit. So many great options. So if you wanna check out Built Bars for yourself, check out my link in the description and use my promo code ABBYSHARP15 to get 15% off of your order. Okay, and you can pause the screen or look at the description to check out my disclaimer, including a trigger warning as we will be discussing weight loss and metabolism boosting hacks. And if you are not already subscribed, hit that sub button and don't forget to follow me over on TikTok and Instagram at Abby's Kitchen. And let's kick things off by discussing my best Best frenemy, caffeine. Love it, hate it, need it or not, there's a lot to unpack. So caffeine is a natural stimulant that 80% of the world's population consume via substances like coffee, tea, energy drinks, soft drinks, and chocolate. Most of us drink coffee to feel more awake, energized, and alert. Some of us don't even feel like ourselves without a hit. <laughs> And this is because caffeine works by blocking the neurotransmitter adenosine, which is responsible for making you feel tired while also stimulating our energizing neurotransmitters, adrenaline, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Love me some neurotransmitter stimulation in the AM. Now, considering the frequency of consumption, it is no surprise that caffeine is one of the most researched edible substances on the planet with most authorities suggesting that it's safe to consume up to 400 milligrams of caffeine a day, which is equivalent to about four cups of coffee. Why the cap? Well, like all substances, it is possible to get too much of a good thing. And in wellness culture, there's a lot of chatter about coffee being toxic, poisonous, or ultimately bad for your health. So today we are going to break down some of those claims and deliver the facts after I get in a little sip, obviously. Let's go. Claim number one, coffee causes anxiety disorders. <gasps> Ooh, that'll do it. We've all done it, right? Like that one extra cup of liquid gold and we are on our ass unable to type a coherent email because our hands don't stop shaking. It's not a good feeling, but I mean, that's kind of what caffeine does. Caffeine is a stimulant, so it can increase blood pressure and heart rate. And for a lot of us, those physical sensations can be interpreted by the mind as like, holy shit balls, something is wrong. And this is especially true among folks who are coffee newbies or who are genetically more sensitive to caffeine. So caffeine sensitivity basically refers to how efficiently your body, specifically your liver, is able to metabolize caffeine and clear it from your system. So for example, fast metabolizers can perhaps tolerate several cups of coffee a day or even have coffee like an hour before bed and have 
no apparent trouble sleeping. While slow metabolizers need to cut themselves off really early to get a good night's rest. We also need to consider someone's experience with caffeine. So one theory is that folks who've made caffeine part of their daily ritual develop more adenosine receptors in the brain, which then bind the caffeine and reduce its kind of buzzy effect over time. And while research suggests that folks with pre-existing social anxiety, panic disorder, or anxiety disorders are at a higher risk of feeling the anxiety-inducing effects of caffeine, it's very important to note that caffeine itself doesn't create an anxiety disorder. Some folks in the research don't actually see an increase in anxiety or perceived stress at all, so this is very much a individualized thing. I have personally cut out caffeine at different points in my life to see if it reduces my anxiety, and between you and I, it just kind of makes me a less happy human being. So not unlike with any substance, this is where we may have to weigh out the benefits and the risk on an individual level. So bottom line, your personal experience with coffee triggering anxiety will likely depend on genetically determined metabolism, your tolerance and consumption habits, when in the day you consume it, and your baseline anxiety levels. So experiment to determine what works best for you. Claim number two, decaf coffee contains carcinogens. Okay, so maybe caffeine and you don't play nice in the sandbox, so you want to switch to decaf. Now there are three common methods by which caffeine is removed from the coffee bean. Number one, the Swiss water process, which uses only water to dissolve the caffeine. Two, the CO2 method, which uses compressed CO2. And three, the most common solvent method, which uses synthetic chemicals like ethyl acetate and methylene chloride. Now when people harp on decaf, it's because of the chemical solvents like methylene chloride used in most brews. Now what we know is that inhaling about 200 parts per million of methylene chloride can temporarily slow down the central nervous system, which depending on the level of exposure could potentially cause things like lightheadedness, coughing, or even shortness of breath. However, the FDA has approved use of methylene chloride in caffeine extraction processes because the final product contains only trace amounts with no more than 10 parts per million. So that is 0.001%. Now research suggests that this amount is far too minuscule to have any negative effects on health. And most decaf coffees on the market today contain levels that are even a hundred times lower than this or as little as one part per million because basically the roasting process effectively can reduce those residues. It's also worth noting that there's a huge difference between taking a whiff of like your cup of decaf and inhaling straight up methylene chloride via like paint thinner, for example. But of course, if you're still concerned and love your decaf, you can always purchase products that use the water method instead. There isn't any regulation requiring decaf processes to be identified on food labels, so you can either look up this information on a brand's website or choose an organic organic product where chemical solvents are not used. Claim number three, coffee contains toxic mold. A lot of influencers insist that coffee contains mycotoxins from molds grown on coffee beans if improperly stored, and that some of these toxins can have carcinogenic properties. So research has found small amounts of these mycotoxins in tested coffee beans, but their levels are consistently far below the safe amount for human consumption. Keep in mind that we are exposed to mycotoxins basically every single day in a wide range of foods, so much so that virtually everyone's blood will test positive for them, and it's even often found in obviously healthy foods like human breast milk. So considering that one study found that consuming your full four cups of coffee per day provided only 2% of the toxin exposure deemed safe, it's likely a non-issue for most. Decaf will have slightly higher amounts, but it's still well below the tolerable level. Now, honestly, the topic of mold injury is a huge one, but just know that most claims associated with this wellness culture concern are BS. Which brings me to claim number four, coffee increases cortisol levels. People love to talk about cortisol without actually knowing much about what it is. But in short, 
Cortisol is a stress hormone that's primarily involved in the body's stress response, which makes it seem very, very bad, but it's actually also important for positive bodily processes like reducing inflammation, supporting nutrient metabolism, and helping to control blood sugar levels. So we need cortisol and it's natural for our levels to be kind of higher in the morning and lower when we go to bed at night, but prolonged periods of elevated levels throughout the day can cause things like headaches, weight gain, insomnia, osteoporosis, immune suppression, and more. So a lot of influencers insist that you should not drink coffee on an empty stomach in the morning because it raises your cortisol levels even higher at a point in the day when it's naturally kind of at its highest point. And this is theoretically true, but realistically, not actually a really big deal. Some studies suggest that caffeine can increase cortisol levels both at rest and during periods of stress, but other research has found no increase in cortisol levels at all. And this individual variation likely has to do with one's sensitivity to stress, anxiety, high blood pressure, and most importantly, their tolerance to caffeine. Here's the really important piece of information that wellness influencers don't tell you. Any effect of caffeine on your cortisol levels seems to diminish with regular caffeine consumption. In other words, if you drink coffee regularly within an hour of waking up, like most human freaking beings do, your body adapts to this habit. It learns, nope, like this is not a bear coming to eat me. That's the thing about bear attacks. They come when you least expect it. It's just the usual double double in a bagel. And this significantly blunts the transient effects on cortisol. And that's a really important other keyword here, transient. I appreciate that if you have a million things working against you and your anxiety disorder, then it absolutely is worth taking all of these little steps to reduce stress and abnormal cortisol levels in the day. But for most people, the minute transient effects of a daily cup of coffee on cortisol levels are unlikely to cause long-term harm. As for the empty stomach concern, I would say theoretically it makes sense to have some food with your coffee if you do experience ill effects, though we don't necessarily have actual evidence that would make a really big deal or difference. So I say, you know, experiment to see what feels best for you. I know that I don't physically feel good if I have coffee on an empty stomach, so I will always pair it with some kind of milk and a latte and usually either breakfast or a snack. Claim number five, it increases insulin and blood sugars. So speaking of drinking coffee on an empty stomach, let's talk about that research on blood sugar. Now, with so much fear around insulin, a lot of influencers are swearing that drinking your black coffee in the morning raises your blood sugars and your insulin levels. Now, we do have some research that folks with type 2 diabetes tend to see a bump in blood sugar and insulin levels after caffeine consumption, which may be related to genetics and caffeine metabolism. And while one study on healthy individuals did find higher fasting insulin levels in folks drinking a big old pot of coffee, the author Authors noted that they did give these guys a whopping 13 cups of coffee straight out the gates, which let's be real, that could have increased stress levels to cause the ill effects. Now it seems that a tolerance to the insulin increasing effect of caffeine occurs over time, which again would explain why a review of the literature found that regular moderate consumption of coffee consistently seems to reduce the risk of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. One of the studies even found that you could reduce your risk by 11% by increasing your coffee consumption. So yes, this is a very complicated area of research and like most nutrition research is highly individualized. But it seems like if you're a regular coffee drinker consuming moderate amounts of coffee and you have a healthy pancreas, your habit is not going to cause abnormal blood sugar levels. And if you have diabetes, it's important to take note of how your morning coffee is affecting your levels and of course switch to decaf if it's a consistent problem. And finally, let's talk claim number six, that caffeine increases metabolism and encourages weight loss. I know you've been waiting since the start for this one, so here it is. There's always been a lot of buzz about caffeine's fat burning and metabolism boosting effects. Is there any truth to this? Well, 
Yes and no. There is some research that caffeine may increase fat burning by up to 13% and boost metabolic rate by 11%. Now, caffeine has also been shown to increase heat production in the body, otherwise known as thermogenesis, which raises body temperature and increases energy expenditure. And while those all seem like really big, exciting numbers to somebody who wants to lose weight and who likes their coffee, you'd likely have to consume an unhealthy amount of caffeine to see any kind of measurable effect on top of your caloric deficit. So for example, one study found that caffeine doses of 4.5 milligrams per pound of body weight increased metabolism by up to 13%. So for someone who weighs 150 pounds, this is equal to 675 milligrams of caffeine or seven cups of coffee, well beyond the four cup a day max recommendation. And even if you could tolerate this amount without undue harm or side effects, it wouldn't necessarily translate to less food consumed or weight lost on the scale. And this is where things get messy as in the research. So with appetite, one study found that drinking coffee shortly before a meal slightly decreased caloric intake since caffeine seems to slightly reduce the hunger hormone ghrelin. However, these appetite suppressing effects don't appear to be sustained like three to four hours after you drink the coffee, leading folks to likely just make up for the missed calories later on. Then on the flip side, other research found no differences in calorie intake when drinking coffee before a meal. So apparently the impact on hunger hormones isn't necessarily consistent or strong. As for the numbers on the scale, some evidence suggests that caffeine intake is associated with a 17 to 28% increase in weight loss. While another study determined that the weight loss from caffeine intake was not statistically significant at all, and that caffeine drinkers were only about one pound lighter than those who did not drink caffeine. It's important to note that all of these pathetically minuscule potential impacts on weight loss are confounded by how and what you take in your coffee. In other words, if you're replacing a Coke with black coffee, then yeah, you're gonna cut 150 calories per drink and over time, you'll potentially lose weight. But if you're adding a double-double to your day, morning, noon, and night, thinking it's gonna magically burn fat off your body, you're probably going to be disappointed. And to take this even further, if your coffee habit is interfering with your sleep, it may actually contribute to weight gain. And this is because unlike the poor mixed research linking caffeine use to lower body weight, sleep research has consistently correlated sleep deprivation with increased appetite, weight, and metabolic disturbances. So as usual, no one finding in nutrition research can be acted on in isolation. We really need to see the forest from the trees. So in conclusion, coffee is not a magical weight loss drug, but it's also not the poison that so many wellness influencers make it out to be. There's also a lot of potential benefits to coffee, like improving gut health, exercise performance, and cognition, while reducing the risk of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and even depression. If you don't need coffee in the morning, Great, but don't belittle us addicts for our habit. The reason I don't review other people's coffee orders here on Abby's Kitchen is that I kind of see coffee or tea or whatever your preference is as like a non-denominational ritual that really should just not be messed with. For a lot of us, coffee sets the tone for the day and only you can determine if that's good or a not so good habit for you. So unless someone's morning cup comes with a side of pseudoscience, I'm gonna just walk on by. Now, please excuse me, I need a little top up here. And on that note, that is all that I have for you guys today. Thanks again to Built Bar for sponsoring. If you like this video, be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below if there are other ingredients or foods you wanna see me review like this. Subscribe to the channel and I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.